Then there's California, beginning our fifth year as a podcast featuring members of the California State Senate Democratic Caucus in conversation about their lives, their legislative priorities, policies, and other related issues that help make California exceptional. From the state capitol in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Last year's legislative session here at the Capitol has been considered by many to be one of the most successful in recent years, especially as the COVID pandemic started to become more of a below-the-fold story to the world and policymakers could focus for once on non-emergency priorities. In fact, the 2022 legislative year opened the door to a bounty of new California laws and policies related to environmental advocacy, education, social justice, reproductive rights, consumer rights, and small business support. As the 2023 legislative year begins, however, it's also easy to see the bounty of unfinished existential sobering business from last year carrying over into the new year, demanding attention from California's lawmakers. The now not easily overlooked ravages of climate change, whether it's wildfires or drought or floods that we're experiencing now, and the stranglehold that fossil fuel and other industries appear to have on the implementation of climate policy, the chronic lack of affordable housing, the chronic trauma of homelessness and mental health treatment gaps, a pending economic downturn. Crises old and new abound. But... Looking ahead at the 2023 legislative season also brings to mind a paraphrase of that lyric from the Broadway musical Hamilton. There's a million things we haven't done. Just you wait. Just you wait. The legislative class of 2023 has hit the ground running here in the new year and being recognized as the most diverse ever coming from local government, the private sector, nonprofits. Add to the mix a newly re-elected and sworn-in governor beginning his second and final four-year term. The lawmakers, both freshmen and those returning, are enthusiastic about delivering for the Californians that have elected and invested in them. On this edition of Then There's California, we're proud to have back with us one of California's distinguished lawmakers who has become one of the legislative leaders most effectively positioned to celebrate and utilize that gift of representative diversity and experienced portfolio. Senator Lena Gonzalez represents Southern California's 33rd Senate District, which includes her hometown of Long Beach. She is the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. She's also the Senate Majority Whip, and she is beginning 2023 as the newly elected vice chair of the California Legislative Latino Caucus. And the last time we spoke to Senator Gonzalez at the end of 2021, she and a few of her colleagues were returning from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, Scotland. And in fact, Senator Gonzalez is not too long back as we speak from two fall climate and transportation technology focused trips in 2022 to Montreal and to Tokyo, Japan. Our last few conversations have been by phone, so it is wonderful to actually break podcast bread in person with this devoted mother of three boys and perennially loyal Chargers fan, last we heard anyway, and maybe not in that particular order. (laughs) Senator Gonzalez, it's a treat to have you back with us. Good to see you too, Brian. It's great to be back with you, and you're making me tired just thinking about all the things that I've done this year. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I've laid out a whole agenda for you, and and you're still recovering from last year's. Still, but yes, a diehard Chargers fan. Well, Happy New Year to you. How are you? How are the boys back home? Even the boy that you're married to. Yes, exactly. That's four boys, plus a dog, which is a girl, thankfully. It's been great. You know, the kids are wonderful. And I always like being asked that question because I'm always a mom first, aside from my Senate position here. But kids are doing really well in school and enjoying after school activities. And just, you know, we're enjoying life as a family, which is great. Well, I assume that your new year has been like everybody else here is in California. And, And man, we have been headed into two weeks into 2023, and we are dealing with atmospheric rivers and flooding and power outages and down trees. And we're not going gentle into this new year so far, are we? We're not. A lot of uh, work ahead, but also just thinking about all the people that have been affected. And so my heart goes out to them. And I know as a Democratic caucus, we've been talking about them, just what we can do next. And so we're ready. And how's the 33rd faring in all of this? How are you guys doing down right. there? Been, you know, taking notes from our district team and talking to our emergency services person And so it's been good so far. I think the latter half of the week we'll start to see. I know in the, you know, near the coastal regions, there's homes right on the beach. We know that a lot of flooding can happen. We know that obviously the issues of sea level rise and lots of different issues with homes just feeling like they're not protected as much. So we got some work to do. And obviously we've got a budget at hand that we've got to talk about. And so a lot of that could, you know, be relatable to the constituents back at home. 
Well, let's talk about the legislative session and in particular, this exceptionally diverse class of lawmakers of which you are already a part. Uh, 50, I think maybe 51 now women yes. serving a uh, high watermark of 52 percent also includes an all time high of Latino legislators and legislative office growing from 32 to 36, as well as more lawmakers openly identifying as LGBTQ. And there's also the first Muslim and Sikh members. So this is indeed the most diverse legislature ever. But is it indeed, from your perspective, starting to look more like California? Absolutely. It's great to see, as you're describing all of these different points of diversity, it's great to see that, especially the, the, the number on women. I think, you know, other legislatures like New Mexico have had like almost 100 percent women. I mean, they've been incredible at what they've been able to do to get more women to run for office. And so I see a lot of opportunity in the years to come for even more diversity and more women at the table, which I think is great. And moms and parents. So it's looking good. For California. You've had a chance to meet as many as possible of your new colleagues. Tell yes. me about them from your perspective. I know you were not too long ago a freshman yourself. In fact, you came in by <laughs> yourself, so you had to navigate all this solo. That's they at right. least have each other. But uh, tell me about some of the people that you're working with right That's now. Right. It is, it's incredible. In the Senate Democratic Caucus, we've got 32 Democrats, I think six new women, one uh, new man, three new Republicans. And so it's really great to be able to see, even talking to them, their bold leadership. You know, a lot of them are, they've been local elected before before in Encinitas and in Hayward or labor leaders and nonprofit leaders. So they're coming in with extensive experience, which I am excited to get to know. Transportation issues is where we can align, homelessness and housing, obviously, worker protections. I'm hearing all of the things that I definitely align with them on. But just talking about it out front, I think in other times when we've seen new legislators, they've been a little bit more coy in talking about their package. And now it's, you know, they're a little bit more bold, which I love. It's great. Well, they're also very frank in talking about their lives. And I think it's yes. also worth noting, and you probably learned just getting to know them, how many of the individuals in this freshman class have this extraordinary life journey, some really daunting and humbling experiences right. that have brought them to this point in their lives with some skills and some learned lessons of life that can actually be used to help Californians legislatively and otherwise. Absolutely. I think we all come with a story. I know we look sometimes good on paper and we've got our resumes with all of our professional designations and our degrees. But at the end of the day, we all have a story about our family life, about, you know, as I've talked to you being a young mom at mm -hmm. 19. And so they all have incredible stories that they're going to be coming with and be legislating off of and really, you know, doing the best for their uh, respective constituencies. So I'm excited to learn more about, again, not just them professionally, but also, to your point, about what who they are personally as well. And you yourself have started 2023, this legislative session, in a really strong leadership position, returning as chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, the Senate Majority Whip, and you are now the vice chair of the Latino Legislative Caucus. And what started with two Latinos elected to the legislature 60 years ago evolved into this, 11 years later, this formal caucus. And the caucus is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. So you'll be one of those in charge. How are you guys going to celebrate? Oh, gosh, we're still talking about it. In fact, just today, one of the assembly members stopped me and said, are we really celebrating 50 years? And I said, yes, it started with two and now we're at 35 and it's incredible. And I'm sure we'll continue to grow. Yeah, 50 years. So we're in the works of potentially a big celebration, a gala. We don't know what that's going to look like. But of course, we're really excited to be able to share and showcase this really good momentum. Well, as we said, the number of Latino electeds are growing in the legislature as well as nationwide. I think yeah. there are 500 Hispanic state legislators wow. across the country, including here in California and in Congress as well. How has that increased Latino presence and agency impacted legislation related to Latinos here in California? It impacts greatly. In fact, specifically with Latinas, you know, I just met with our commission on the status of women and girls, and they have done a profile specifically with Latina women and talking about how Latina women during the pandemic we're more likely to become entrepreneurs. And when you're more likely to be an entrepreneur as a Latina, then you're more likely, the statistics show, to also create more family-friendly policies. So it's incredible to see that this type of growth on the economic front, you know, in the Latino caucus, we've we've led on broadband for all, Medi-Cal for all, ensuring that our districts are seeing significant investments on the budget side, whether it's a hospital or a new building uh, for high school or what have you. We have been very, very proactive. Water issues, like what we say in the Latino caucus, every mm -hmm. issue to us is a Latino issue. And so having now creeping towards that 40 percent parity with the population, we're now at, I think, 30 something percent, 32 percent uh, here in the California legislature of Latino representation. It makes a big, big difference uh, to have us here representing at the table and 
working on these policies that matter to everybody. Well, and to your point, what are considered Latino issues are, in fact, California issues. Absolutely, they are. We have done so much incredible work. I'm proud of the Latino caucus. My colleague, a former chair, Senator Duras, has done a great job, and Assemblymember Rob Brevis is the, the, the former vice chair. Now I've got Assemblymember Sabrina Cervantes as right. the chair. So together, two Latinas, again, striving to ensure that everybody's voice is heard in the caucus, but we're also being intersectional, working with other ethnic caucuses uh, to be able to get work done for the greater good. Looking back at the 2022 elections, there were 34.5 million Latinos eligible to vote in last year's election. Every 30 seconds, so I read, a Latino in the U.S. becomes eligible to vote. Mm-hmm. And they are still referred to, the, the population, the community is still referred to as the sleeping giant of the electorate. And you mentioned Senator Durazo. I talked to her a couple of years ago, and she hated that <laughs> term because it made the Latino voting bloc seem like this strategic nut that had to be cracked yes. <laughs> at every election. Do you agree with that? I absolutely Absolutely agree. I also d- kind of despise that quote um, because the, the other point of it too is that we're not a monolith. I always say, you know, Latinos are Democrats, Republicans, uh, depending on where you came from, and if maybe your uh, family immigrated from either Cuba or uh, Mexico or or uh, Guatemala, you have a different experience, and so we are not all the same. And so our, our issues might be different. But also our voting patterns could be very different, as we've seen over the last few election cycles. So it's we're learning, and especially as the Senate or as the Latino Democratic Caucus, I think we're learning what that looks like based on various regions as well of the state of California. So Mm -hmm. but nonetheless, there are a lot of issues that we align on. And so we look forward to continuing to push those and talk about the issues we might not be aligned on exactly. But. Let's speak about the issues that we all align on and looking at the legislative year ahead and the year past. And as I mentioned, there were some headlines at the start of 2023 that legislatures facing this raft of old problems that, if anything, from last year that perhaps even have worsened this year. And I know you and your colleagues fully acknowledge that. But keeping that in mind, what is ahead for the Democratic caucus in terms of policy, both the Latino caucus, but just the Democrats as a whole? Well, Senate Democratic Caucus, we, as you mentioned, super robust last year. We built a climate working group with the pro Tems leadership, about a dozen senators that leaned in on climate. And we, of course, ran the gamut on what we felt on climate action and environmental justice. And we were able to build about a portfolio of about 12 bills that were incredible bills on zero emission vehicles, on carbon neutrality, on a variety of different things, clean energy. And we also um, know that we still had issues like homelessness and housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have 160,000 so far unhoused individuals in California. We still have a deficit of 2 million homes that we need to build. We still have, unfortunately, a Supreme Court that has overturned Roe v. Wade and over 100 bans across the country. And California has been a leader on reproductive health. The Senate Democratic Caucus has led on every single one of these issues, both in budget and policy. And so what I always like to say, our legislative has moved forward. And in this year, it's going to move forward even under economic uncertainty, while we've also maintained oversight. So we've also looked at the past and said, OK, we're doing all this good work on maintaining pregnant people's re- reproductive health and housing, homelessness, environmental justice, while also looking back and saying we still need to provide oversight on capital expenditures like climate resiliency and transportation and ensuring that mental health and education are still at the forefront. And what are we doing with those dollars? So I think we've been very, very proactive on many fronts to be able to tackle these issues. And we'll still tackle a lot of them in this next year with tighter budget controls, unfortunately. There are some cynics out there who say that because the progressive Democrats are so dominant here at the Capitol, it should be easier for all of you to do what's necessary to Mm. tackle this wish list for all the outstanding issues. But that because you are so dominant as a party and as progressives, that that just makes it easier for you guys to avoid making the hard decisions. Is that fair? It's not fair because similar to what I say about the Latino caucus, the Democratic caucus is also not a monolith. I mean, we do believe in all of these things, but the Democratic caucus also has a variety of different, depending on where you're at in the state of California, you come at it a different way. We all are trying to find the same outcome, right? Which is at the end of the day, this Democratic caucus is committed to ensuring that we're improving people's lives. But what I believe in going about environmental justice and climate might be different from what a colleague believes in Central Valley. 
But what's nice about this caucus is we've all come together. Mm -hmm. And the Climate Working Group was one example. We came together and we were able to sort of stretch outside of the box to find ways to be able to compromise on bills and, and matters that meant most to us, most importantly to Californians. Climate Working Group in years past, housing as well, which has always been a challenge and controversial. But here we were doing the, the hard work that needed to be done from various regions of the state. More hard work to be done on the budget. You've already referenced it a couple of times. The governor, as we speak just this morning, Governor Newsom releasing his first take on the 2023-2024 state budget, a $297 billion spending plan. And with a realizing nod to our current economic fragility, also a $22.5 billion shortfall in the upcoming fiscal year. And nobody is surprised by that. And the governor and the legislature have really positioned themselves for reacting to that shortfall this year, and we're in a much better place than we might have been in previous shortfalls in past years. And despite the deficit, it still sounds like Governor Newsom is doubling down, if you will, on still some of the state's consistent needs, including uh, transitional kindergarten and education and and other issues. Now, I don't expect you to have read the fine print, although knowing you, you probably already have in just the last five (laughs) or six hours. But what's your first glance perspective on this new budget that's still a work in progress? It's still a work in progress. And as we know, this is the very first crack at what this budget could look like. And April, we'll see what revenues will actually look like as they come in for you know our tax deadlines. Um, May, you have the revise, so there's another opportunity there to kind of tweak things and, and look at what the actuals could be. And last year, we were surprised. Although we had two years of a, of a budget surplus of over $100 billion, yes. we were swimming in cash, it seemed like, and being able to do so much of one-time funding for our districts and just statewide projects. What we saw last year is that the actuals actually came out more positive than we expected. And so it could potentially be the same thing this year. We don't know. But I don't want people to be so alarmed as though the sky is falling. So April will be a good time to to check back in, of course, and May. But what I would also say is that even throughout all of this, as mentioned, it's education still intact. Housing and homelessness still seem to be robust. Uh, $15 billion for homelessness housing, permanent support, temporary housing, mental health, and then also thinking about economic development. Small businesses are still hurting really bad. So $11 billion that he's earmarked for economic development, job growth, workforce development. So it's, it's, you know, it's looking good. And what's nice is the Democratic caucus has weighed in very, very proactively. Senator Skinner, our budget chair, has been incredible, along with our budget team. And we have also allowed during this time of uncertainty, although we knew it was going to, you know, we're, we weren't going to hit an, another surplus, $35 billion reserve is not bad. Right. So we've got comfort. We've got some space to look and, and see what we can do for the next few years. And a lot of these former budget appropriations were also multi-year. So mm-hmm. it could be that we tweak some of the years. It could be backfilling. There's a lot of different opportunities. So more to come. Well, yeah. So any hard decisions that had to be made between yeah. now and June 30th might not be as hard as they might have been in other years I based know. on that rainy day fund and the multi-year planning, et cetera. Absolutely. Well, speaking of hard decisions, potentially hard decisions, Governor Newsom on swearing in day in December asked you and your colleagues in the legislature to convene a special session to combat the spiking gas prices by penalizing oil companies for their record profits. And it was probably wise that the governor and the legislature have slow walked this plan through the process rather than making (laughs) freshman lawmakers vote on uh, going after the oil industry as one of their first acts of duties on swearing in day. But the plan is evolving into a proposal to charge the California Energy Commission with setting gas price standards each year. And if the oil companies exceed those undetermined caps on their profits, they could face fines. Mm -hmm. And many of the fines would be placed into a price gouging penalty fund. What are your thoughts on that plan as you've seen it cook over the last month or so? And how do you think you and your colleagues are going to act on it? Great question. And that's the question of the day that I get from many constituents, sure. and especially as we were heading into swearing in. I mean, the eyes that were, you know, so bold with our new legislators that were saying, do we have to take a vote on this today? And I said, no, <laughs> not today. More to come. I, I first want to thank the uh, Energy Commission for taking the first crack at this and really delving in. I mean, the, the commissioner's questions, I think it was it was incredible. And, and their reports have been really extensive. And I've been on top of all of it, my team and I. And so it's been great to see what the narrative has been and what we're facing. And so four refineries uh, shut down without explanation in the state for maintenance. And I'm, I'm using air quotes right here for everyone that can <laughs> not see me for maintenance. And so that is an issue. The issue that two of the largest uh, oil companies, Chevron 
and Exxon made over $40 billion in the last quarter of 2022. Um, they made increases even larger than their previous record at, in 2011. I think it was a 40% increase over the last decade. While our Californians were dealing with the pinch at the pump at $7 um, for, per gallon. And our lowest resourced Californians still dealing with that. So it is a huge issue. And I think it's Unfortunately, a lot of times this happens around election time. Just miraculously, a lot of these things just, just happen. So we need to get to the bottom of it. We need to Californians to understand that it's not necessarily environmental regulations that have been in the works, you know, have been in place and mandated for de- a decade or so. It's really a mix of different things. It's complex. But the oil and gas industry does need to take responsibility for this. And I would hope in the next few months we have these really robust discussions where we can hopefully ensure that they actually show up and we can talk to them face to face, just like they would do so in Congress. So we really need to ensure that we make this happen. I think more importantly, our constituents are asking lots of questions of us and we need answers. Is it making a difference that we now, as we speak here in January, are paying two to three, four dollars less a gallon than we were back in the summer and the early fall? Is that softening the blow or taking away some of the urgency of this? It's softening the blow, I think, but you know, people are still dealing with it. I mean, they're dealing with it. I mean, you know, and they're kind of conflating it all together, right? It, it's gas one day and it's eggs and milk the other day. The inflation of 8% right now is just still, it's still prevalent in people's lives. So nonetheless, I think people still want answers and we need to get them from these these industries that have really, you know, gone unregulated in some cases in California. Like I said, four to five refineries shutting down all at once is not, Okay, and we need to find an explanation as to why they were doing so and why the costs have gone up for consumers when everything else like crude oil and other costs have gone down. Well, we know fossil fuels are part of the big carryover policy priority from last year into this year, uh, climate change prevention and preparedness. And the legislature last year had a watershed climate policy year, but there's more work and challenges to unpack in that regard in this new year. And some of your colleagues joined the delegation to the Conference of Parties meeting in Egypt last fall, and you joined colleagues and experts on two separate international visits at the end of the year to Tokyo to learn more about high-speed rail. And then you went to Montreal to Quebec for another COP. I think it was 15, COP 15, a UN conference on nature and biodiversity, where I know there were some sweeping agreements on a unified plan for protecting nature, halting a decline in biodiversity. Talk about those conferences and your presence there. Sure. First, you know, with Japan, incredible to be able to be a part of that as chair of transportation and with my assembly colleague in transportation as well, assembly member Laura Friedman. It was incredible to see the high-speed rail system that was a public-private partnership with the JR, they're called the Japanese, um, the JR Central High-Speed Rail Maglev, so this magnetic um, system that if you want to go three hours away from Tokyo, it it would take you a little over an hour to get there through this high-speed rail versus car, three hours. So it's incredible. It goes about um, almost 300 miles an hour and just a wonderful way to go in and out of various places around Japan and a way that is zero emission, a way that is um, safe and clean and feels good for many of the Japanese residents that are there and has a lot of opportunity for revenue intake. You know, they have commercial properties that are surrounding the land around the Shinkansen, the, the high-speed rail that basically is created into hotels and, and shops. And there's it's a destination point, you know, and that's the way it should be in, in transportation. That's where a lot of global economies, what they do, uh, Germany and Japan and other Portugal. So we have a lot to learn from Japan in that sense. Um, we also uh, toured the port of Kobe. As a port senator, it was great to see that. And the opportunities for hydrogen shipping, which I know, I think for us in the Long Beach area and Los Angeles area, some of the worst air quality in the world, figuring out how we can reduce emissions in our shipping and logistics. And they are in a prototype now with a hydrogen ship to be able to do that through the Japanese Kawasaki Center which was great. And then a lot of hydrogen, a lot of talk on hydrogen. 
Japanese is very natural resource poor. And so they're looking at ways that they can create a hydrogen hub in, in Japan, which is incredible through their homes, again, through shipping, through medium heavy duty, light duty cars. I mean, they're just doing everything. Sounds <laughs> like it. Yes. Around hydrogen, which is fantastic. Yeah. But it, it was great to see the opportunities there and what we can do to, to partner with Japan moving forward. Now, as you look at the successes with high-speed rail in Japan and what is not only the future but the present, and then you turn to look here in California at our own attempts here so far at high-speed rail, we're really the first experiment in the U.S. for putting together high-speed rail. And in some cases, it's been considered this multi-billion dollar nightmare, and there's just been so much change and so much political intrigue and so much over-budgeting that the fear is that it will never be what it was originally supposed to be. Now, just from your purview as chair of transportation, we all want the best. And in theory, this is a marvelous thing. What are your responses? Well, again, in theory, it's wonderful. We want to make sure that we're moving forward. We just allocated $4.2 billion yesterday, which was last year. So we have made a commitment, and we've said with our budget that we are going to move forward. And right now, I think as Los Angeles and San Francisco are saying, okay, what's where's our part of it, the bookends, right? Yes. And then even other, other places like Southeast Los Angeles and Inland Empire and San Diego are saying, well, how can we think bigger about connecting the high-speed rail? I think we need to do a lot of inner work to see how we can do things a bit differently. Um, I think the retail space, creating destinations at some of these transportation hubs, creating more revenue sources that are creative, like Japan does, I think could be something really interesting. I believe Texas and another location on the East Coast is also going to be moving ahead with high-speed rail. They're in the works with Japanese investments. So it'll be interesting to see where those end up and how they start their discussions on what high-speed rail could look like as well. So I think we've got a lot of going outside of California to do if we really want to complete this high-speed rail project. No, thank you for tackling that. Okay, Montreal was biodiversity and really focused on environment to a great degree. So COP15, this was a smaller conference of parties, and this uh, conference of parties was um, hosted um, by the Enviro voters, and it was more focused on biodiversity. So it's not like the large conference of parties that uh, occurred in Egypt, but this one was very focused on biodiversity. So specifically, it was focused on the 30 by 30 plan that California has created, which is was an executive order by the governor about a year ago that said that we need to protect and restore over at least 30% of our natural uh, working lands and oceans by 2030. And luckily, out of a lot of the negotiations that happened here at this COP, over 190 countries and cities said yes, they would do that. And many did not say that before. So that was an incredible outcome for COP15. And specifically, our delegation... There was a a handful, I think seven assembly members and senators and the Natural Resources Secretary Wade Crowfoot and his team talked to many, many nations and cities, specifically, of course, our friends in Quebec. We share a carbon market with them. We were passing around ideas about, you know, what our carbon market could look like. They said, what are you all doing? We talked about actually their pension portfolios and what they were focused on, which they're doing a lot of climate investments in their own transit system to make it zero emission electric charging. So they're really on top of that. We talked to Jalisco, Mexico about their deforestation to prevent deforestation over there. They've got a lot of agave for tequila and avocados, and we share this agricultural connection. So talking about how we can collaborate more to help them with their prevention of deforestation needs. So it was a, it was a lot of great networking. I really yes. like this COP a bit better because it was more focused. If you're going to have a fall recess, this is what you, you, agree. you know, I know yes. you're working, but I Absolutely. mean, it's still Nice. It was freezing there, yes. but it was great. <laughs> a lot of work. Well, when you came back from Glasgow, Scotland, you and your colleagues at the end of 2021, we talked about how the climate crisis is not just global, but local. And I had asked you your perspective of being at, at an international conference, not only as the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, and also, as you said here with these conferences, as being representative of a port city, but also representing communities of color. You also being a Latina lawmaker and those communities in your district that are affected by climate decisions, local and global every day. You were very mindful of that in Scotland in 2021. Were you mindful of that space last fall in Quebec and in Japan? Absolutely. I think it's important to be there. 
historically, I think lawmakers that don't look like me have been there. And I say that respectfully, but I think it's nice to know that there are shared experiences, whether that is, you know, African communities that are feeling the same sort of hurt because they don't feel that they have in a global perspective that they have gotten the investments, monetary investments from the United Nations and really the attention that they need for loss and damage, you know, for flooding and for earthquakes and what have you. It feels the same back at home in Southeast LA and Long Mm -hmm. Beach is, you know, we don't oftentimes feel like we've gotten the attention and the appropriate budget investments that we've needed. So it's, it's good for a Latina lawmaker to be at the table advocating for these issues. So yes, it's always top of mind for me. 2022 was a watershed year for climate policy on many levels, but it appears too that the governor and the legislature now have this two-pronged challenge in making all these goals a reality (laughs) and making it disciplined and realistic And there are skeptics in and out of government who are questioning this lack of clear strategy Mm -hmm. in reaching our ambitious emission goals, including the legislative analysts kind of taking California to task and releasing the statement saying that it lacks specificity. Mm -hmm. Talking to Senator Laird before he left for Egypt for his COP, he said, we are meeting those goals. California is meeting those goals. But clearly there are other entities with skin in the game that seem to still take California to task. Are we being realistic enough about these goals and at the same time acting fast enough? It's a great Hard question. Balance. It's always a balance. And that is a, such a great question. I do think we are progressing and we are moving. What's incredible, again, being at these conferences and saying we are going to hit our carbon neutrality goal by 2045. And we still have the mandate for no in-state sales of gas powered cars, light duty cars by 2035 and medium heavy duty by 2045. The globe listens. And so, you know, having a 30 by 30 plan and going to Quebec and talking about that, the nations have listened over almost 200 of them bought on and said, yes, we want to go with the California plan and we still have more work to do. So it it seems a a little like we're all over the place at some, in some cases, but we're really not, we're really focused. And I know that we've put in the hard work. Can we always do more? Absolutely. But I think with where we're at now, I think we're doing a pretty darn good job. And we're the only state that's really doing this. It's only stepping up as aggressively as we are. Yes, that is correct. And I know others will come along, but we've just, we've got to be out there first in in some cases. Another participant in all of this, of course, as you well know, is the fossil fuel industry in particular. And one of the major contributions to the sterling package of climate legislation that came out of last year's session was your SB 1137, which would ban new oil wells within relatively close range of sensitive sites like homes and schools and hospitals. And that really was a legislative victory. You and Senator Lamone partnered on that against the toxic impacts of the neighborhood oil drilling, which, again, as I know, you and your communities in the 33rd are very familiar with that. The industry has long been opposed. They cite the job losses in the industry as we transition out of fossil fuels and we are attempting to eliminate the cleanest oil production in the world. And the industry, led by the California Independent Petroleum Association, has decided to use the initiative process to fight Mm -hmm. back. They have gathered, they say, enough signatures to force a referendum on the 2024 ballot pending approval from Secretary of State that, if passed by the voters, would overturn this new setbacks law. This isn't the first time the business or industry has tried to, I guess, taking settled law and junking it, putting it on ice. And while they're not always successful, the result is often, at the very least, a really costly delay in implementation, particularly in something as important as this. What's your reaction to it? I'm uh, SB 1137, let me start there, is at the end of the day, it protects people's health. And the only ones that stand to benefit from SB 1137 are Californians. That's it. (laughs) So uh, opposite of that, you're protecting the oil and gas industry is what it is. I'm going to just say it. And it's important to know that through this referendum process, which is very easy to do for companies that are making $40 billion in profit over the last six months, very easy to pay people $20 to $40 per signature collect 600,000 signatures, and then turn it into the Secretary of State. It's very easy to do that process. But it is important to know that people are suffering every single day. They're dying of air pollution and asthma. There are kids in my community and many communities like Kern County and San Joaquin that are suffering, have inhalers. I have to advocate every year for the maritime industry to provide air filters in many of the classrooms because the air is so dirty. And so it's important that we we passed this. And I thank many of the colleagues that said yes to this. And I know it was a stretch for some, but it was important to do. 
will continue to do this. And they, uh, right now, as it stands, I think the gas and oil industry already spent about $18 million just on this referendum process. They could have put that money towards health initiatives. We could have put that money towards, you know, capping wells and moving on and transitioning to hydrogen or whatever else they think is the next transition for alternative fuels or electrification, but they didn't. All they're doing is fighting us. So it's going to continue to be a battle, but it's important for us to continue educating the public on on who stands to benefit from this bill and what the gas and oil industry is up to. To their point, what's to become of the workers in the industry, the oil and gas workers? I have read that there are, what was it, 20,000 fossil fuel workers who are at risk of displacement over the next 20 years as the need for their skill declines. And there's 80 percent of those who are likely to be paid less for jobs that they might find in other industries. And I know... There is that fear out there that represents the nucleus to their opposition to bills like yours. Can enough of them find training? Can enough of them find job transition support? Uh, Is there enough money in the state coffers to be able to help them over that leap? What are you and your colleagues and the governor doing about that, notwithstanding the opposition to what is a really good climate progressive bill? Yes, we can. I absolutely think we can provide job opportunities. Job opportunities are already there in the solar industry. The administration with the legislature's help provided a $54 billion climate package last year, may go down to maybe 40 something billion, but still nonetheless, billions of dollars for climate opportunities for jobs. So we know, and being the the daughter of a truck driver who was a tradesperson for 30 years, I don't think about this work without thinking about them. And I know that many of them I've talked to were were talking about uh, transitions like hydrogen. You know, we're doing a lot of uh, work at the port of Long Beach now to decarbonize our hard to decarbonize industries like the maritime industry, heavy trucking. There are opportunities. The uh, Biden's Inflation Reduction Act also provides an opportunity with dollars coming to us to enable us to create more of a market share with the electric vehicle space. Lithium Valley is an opportunity to create that you know market share to produce more lithium batteries in the, the state of California and for uh, folks to get trained on this. I don't want to be naive to say that that this is going to be an easy transition, but I know that it can happen. And I know that the the jobs are there. We just have to work together. But I also don't want the gas and oil industry to continue to monopolize these workers to make them think that there isn't opportunities for this transition either. There are. And actually, I thought about your dad as I was thinking about these particular questions and particularly the the transition to the non-diesel powered trucks. Is he as a I don't know if he's retired or if he's, he's still. Retired, yes. Yeah. Is yes. he supportive, not just because he's cut Linda <laughs> Gonzalez as his daughter, but is he supportive of this kind of transition? Absolutely. And I think, you know, he was a longtime diesel heavy duty trucker for 30 years and he was a laborer before that pouring cement and, you know, riding a crane and and all of that. So he gets it. He understands, but he also knows too, you know, you, you've got to Go in this with ease. He he gives it to me real. So he'll tell me if I'm doing something sure. bad. And I confide in he's him a lot. He's a good sounding board he's to have. He's a great sounding board. And he's very honest with me. But yes, I think knowing and talking to my friends and the Teamsters, you know, knowing that we have to make this transition, everyone gets it. It's just how are we going to do it? Are the investments there? And we need to do it mindfully with labor at the table. We can never say, well, we're going to do this in theory and do it, you know, in this silo of the capital and then forget them. We can't do that. We've got to bring them along. All right, from the international stage to what's going on with the ports and what's going on with trucks and fossil fuels, let's totally switch gears. Let's go to the streets, so to speak. One of your badges of legislative pride this last year is prioritizing street vendors in California. They are ubiquitous on California streets and communities. They are the driver of our economy because they are actually entrepreneurs. They make a living. They bind a community together with their food trucks and their cooking spots. And their survival depends on making that living. And in the past, they have faced barriers that prevent them from growing their businesses and being successful. But you authored a bill last year that potentially increases their economic opportunity. So tell us about SB 972 and tell us about who these entrepreneurs are and the the communities that they're helping with their their hot dog stands and their contribution to farmers markets and everything. Well, you know, being a Los Angeles senator, I don't know where you go in Los Angeles without getting, you know, your hot dog 
dog, bacon wrapped hot dog or your fruit cart and seeing hardworking people on our streets every single day, just trying to make a living, but doing what they love. And at the end of the day, you hear their stories and you hear that they sometimes want to own a restaurant or they want to grow their business and they're very savvy. They want to be included in our California economy. They just haven't had the tools to do that. The problem was that a former bill, which by my predecessor, who did great work in this space as well, uh, then Senator Ricardo Lara, um, had this bill that basically stated we want to legalize street food vending and decriminalize them. I built off of that bill on the economic side, basically stating that we want to to do just that. But there's been modernizations to the California Retail and Food Code. We know that new cart designs have come about where they're not 10,000 pounds anymore. They might be, you know, a lot smaller, easier to move around. Maybe if you're cooking something, you don't need three compartments. You only need two. This still upholds health and safety while also ensuring that we're including the economy, while also ensuring that locals have the opportunity for some control, whether that's maybe setting some hours of operation or buffer zones between brick and mortar small businesses and and street food vending, whatever the case. But we wanted to make sure that folks had avenues in working with the counties and city health departments to actually do the work. And right now, city of Long Beach hosted a huge um, street food vending workshop, over a hundred vendors attended. That's in their awesome. language. Wow. So it's a lot of that work in, in mindfully and proactively working with this community. Well, I know that some of the vendors are still having some trouble navigating this process yeah. and being successful. They're, some of them are getting shut down for allegedly selling unsafe food and getting pushback from public and other businesses who may consider them competition. Cooking on site when they're actually supposed to be cooking off site and bringing mm-hmm. the food to the street already cooked mm-hmm. and not operating with a health permit. This regulatory system is still daunting for them. How do you want to still help them and encourage them so they don't celebrate the success of this new law and then get shut down by something that they just had not planned for or had not fully dealt with already? Yeah, well, I, this is a big education. So this is going to be a statewide education sort of campaign. I don't want this bill, 972, to just fall flat and say, okay, well, let's hope that it gets sure. implemented the right way. Just today at Contract Cities Association, I talked about this bill in length with many over 100 cities and talked about if you have questions, please let me know. But we can't carry this narrative as though this bill was a free-for-all and still allowing the you know illegal food Uh, services or expired food or anything like that. We don't want that. We wouldn't want that in a brick and mortar. We wouldn't want that in any sort of business operation. But what this bill does is inclusive economy, upholding health and safety. And so it's going to take a lot of education. But I think also on the, the side of city governments to be able to be proactive and say, if we've got this issue here that we claim is an issue with street food vending and we really want to be proactive, let's a lot of the time, it's just let's connect with this community mm-hmm. and maybe provide them education in their language. And it's not just the Latino community. I have Cambodian night markets that occur, so we need the language in Khmer. We have African night markets in uh, Little Ethiopia and in Los Angeles. So it's going to take some time. It's going to take some handholding, and we're just going to have to work together on that. But you're right. Education, communication, yes. and listening also. Yes. To Half the, the battle. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, just to wrap it up here yeah. uh, as we get ready to close, and again, from health effects of oil drilling in sensitive areas to the economic opportunity to street vendors to making it harder to steal and sell catalytic converters and right. even the profound Abortion Accessibility Act that you authored yes. earlier in the year, you have had a very successful 2022. And I don't want to make you tip your hand to what you're going to be doing for this year. Mm-hmm. But I guess a question I can ask is, does your previous legislative portfolio give us an idea oh. about what Senator Gonzalez is going to try to do for know. 2023? That's a good question. You know, I have a first, I have an incredible team. I mean, I, yes. this team is on top of it. And more importantly, they carry the same values as my district residents do. And all of this somehow touches our, our residents so, so deeply. But yes, while I have my, my, I say my short time here, short or long, depending on what, how you feel about it, I'm going to do everything in my power to do as most as I can for the incredible people that I represent. So, you know, we'll still, we might have some worker protections in there. So of course, environmental justice, women's issues, and just at the end of the day, ensuring that we're improving people's health and well-being in California. That's all that matters to me. 
I guess just like that Hamilton lyric I referred to, just you wait, just you wait. <laughs> just you wait, exactly, more wait, to come. Just to, again, as we wrap up, we have been through what have just been the last few years, just crazy existential times. Yeah. Every day is a deep breath, and we've survived another day to live another year. What are some of your hopes for this next year, 2023? And as cliche as that question sounds, yeah. looking ahead for California, for your own family, for your communities, what are your fingers crossed for for this year? Taking a real vacation, <laughs> non-work related. That, yes, yes. Um, I mean, Montreal is nice, but when you've got an agenda, it's hard. Yes, but really, I think, you know, for me, just spending more time with the family, of course, is always like a priority of mine every year. But this year, I think, you know, we, we've also spent a lot of time as a team really reevaluating. It's not just moving ahead and let's just dump, you know, 10 more bills on our plate. But what did we let's look back as well, see what we can provide oversight on implementing and making sure that it's actually touching our community. So broadband and street food vending and and oil wells. We need to make sure that, you know, this work is actually hitting the streets in a way that's, you know, very mindful and effective. So. That's my my goal for this year. And then, of course, you know, continuing to be a good team player in the Senate Democratic Caucus. I really Indeed. enjoyed my colleagues. Indeed. We've enjoyed having you here. Thank you so much for coming back. It's great Thank to see you. you in person. And it's always fun to plow through all of these issues with you in a podcast format. So thank you for joining us. And thank you, Brian. You're so awesome. I appreciate all the opportunities with you. So thanks. The feeling mutual. Great to have you awesome. here. State Senator Lena Gonzalez representing the 33rd Senate District in Long Beach. And that wraps this edition of Then There's California. Proud to have technical and production assistance from Martin Ashley, Bob Brulte, Brian Shadden and Rainier Sabiniano, John Roman, Michelle Baker, Anne DeGrazia, Lisa Murphy, McLenna Woods, and the graphic artistry of Tim Davis. On behalf of State Senator Lena Gonzalez, I'm Brian Green from the State Capitol in Sacramento. Thanks for listening to Then There's California. <laughs>